get to some experiments on quantum magnetism, I want to briefly discuss the photonic quantum gas microscope. So in the last course we saw how we saw how bosons we can have this uh, single atom, single side resolution, and we basically can also do that now for photons. There are several experiments in the world that can do that. Just a few pictures of those where you see these fluorescent images of single atoms in those lattices. I want to focus a little bit how well we do that. Resolution. Again, when I talk about charge, remember I don't mean any real charge atoms for us to carry density, only the neutral atoms, but we just adopt the language of the So uh, we basically do the following in our experiment. We set up uh, two lattices, one physics lattice, uh, where we do the experiments. This is where everything happens, every, all the physics you, you heard about, basically. Okay. And then we have a detection lattice, and this detection lattice is uh, more short spaced and super sampled the physics lattice. Okay, so there's much finer grains, uh, uh, grain, so basically uh, super sampling this um, physics lattice, and that allows us to basically, for example, if, even if you have two atoms on the original site, they will typically not end up on uh, two atoms on the same detection lattice. And that's good because remember we have this parity projection issue. Uh, in the detection, when two atoms were on the same lattice site and turned on resonant light to scatter, they were lost because of this light induced collision process. But here, the trick is if we have two atoms on a physics lattice site, which is the one relevant for what we want to discuss, they will end up on two distinct uh, detection lattice sites, and that's good because now we can see them. And if these detection lattice sites are close enough, and we can tell you know, which of these detection lattice sites corresponding to the original physics lattice site, then we can tell what they are. All right, so here are some parameters how this works. So this is the pinning lattice at 500 nanometer separation. Uh, On-site trap frequencies are pretty large for both atom experiments in the megahertz range, which is kind of more something you can be here for high trap experiments. Now, the way how we then make these atoms fluoresce, uh, remember, we have to avoid, we want to them to fluoresce, they scatter light, so we see them. But on the other hand, scattering light also always means heating. And we don't want that the atoms in the detection process basically boil out of the lattice. So we have this detection lattice now, where we pin the atoms to certain sides. So the atom is here, that was its detection. Uh, we don't want, when we image the atom, that it moves over here, because then we get the wrong position. So we have to maintain that the atom is fluorescing and cooling at the same time, so it stays low in this potential um, landscape and does not kind of boil over or move over into another lattice site. And the way to do that is to simultaneously have fluorescence, photon scattering and cooling going on in the system. And one efficient way of doing that in, in ion traps and atom experiments is so-called Raman cooling. So here's the basic idea. So we focus on a single lattice site. So you have these harmonic oscillators on the single side. And our atom has typically different hyperfine states. This would be just if you don't know what that is corresponds to two different spin states which have an energy separation between each other. And each of those spin states, each of those hyperfine states has an associated harmonic oscillator connected to them. And there's some maybe electronically excited state. Here's the separation for lithium that we have. And then uh, what we can do is we can basically use a two-photon transition via this excited state to drive a transition from an atom here in, in, in this state, as you call the one half, for example, this operational state to the F equal 3 half state, but we tune the difference frequency of those lasers such that they take out one vibrational quantum in the photon process. So the atom here ends up actually now in the F equal 3 half state with one vibrational quantum less. So it actually seems that it's cooled, but that's not cooling yet because if you would just keep this two photon later on, that's a coherent coupling, you would just rather oscillate back and forth between those states. So that's not good enough yet. But if we now provide a, a so-called recomper laser to drive the transition from F equal 3 half ground state to the excited state, uh, this excitation will preserve the vibrational quantum number, and the decay process will preserve the vibrational quantum number as well if we're in this very tight and confining regime, uh, so-called map decay regime. Then what's going to happen is now we kind of excite the atom to the excited state here. From here it decays, it preferentially decays 
the same vibrational quantum number state, so we end up with the atom of f equal one half, where we started out in the cooling process, but now with one vibrational quantum number. And this is precisely where the cooling has happened. The cooling is essential to have this scattered photon in this spontaneous emission event, and this is also, if you think about it, where the entropy of our initial gas goes, because we're starting with a gas which carries some entropy, thermal uh, distribution, and we want to basically create uh, ideally a uh, V equals zero kind of atom perfectly in one state, so we have to get rid of the entropy, and the way to get rid of the entropy is always through the spontaneous emission process. So only if you have the spontaneous emission process can you have true cooling, and this is how this works. And the spontaneous scattering also provides the photon that we use for fluorescence detection. That's the scattered photon that we can then collect with our microscopes in, in the end. All right, so let me show you some pictures of how that looks. Um, so we can do that for fermions now, uh, the dilute gas, medium um, dense gas, or much denser gas, where we end up basically close to a band insulator with the unit occupation of one fermion. Now that aside, so you can actually see here we don't have the parallel projection, so we can really tell this difference between zero, one, and two atoms. Uh, so here you can see there is a hole, there is one atom, and there is basically two atoms. You also see these rectangles, they're the physical lattice side, and you can see that the fluorescent spot sometimes not quite centered on that physical lattice side, because we have, it's a detection lattice when you connect it in, right? But uh, they are so close to the original physical lattice side that we can associate that fluorescence uh, to the original physics that aside and completely reconstruct a map of the atom distribution here uh, without parity projection. So we see holes, single atoms, uh, doubly occupied sites in, in the system without this parity projection. Okay? Uh, but not yet spin resolved. So, so far we don't see where the spin is in the system. And I'll tell you in a second how that actually how we can do uh, that spin resolved detection. Now what can you do from some images like these? Well, you can just average them. Okay, that's the first thing you could do. Uh, if you average uh, hundreds of different images like this one, starting from the same state, then you get a picture like this one, and that's the average density distribution uh, on each lattice site that you get. Okay, and it's a bit potato shaped or uh, a little bit weird, so it's not nice and round. That's some artifact. We have some uh, inhomogeneities that we're kind of working on to get rid of right now in this experiment, but that's just how it is. Okay, so that's just the average density distribution that you have, but you can also go to more interesting quantities. You can, for example, look at the fluctuations of particle number of sites. So how many, because you're getting single snapshots, you can look what's the variance of particle number fluctuations uh, relative to the mean, and there you actually see something interesting already, that in this band insulating state, you have a strong suppression of fluctuations of the particle number uh, relative to the mean by about uh, almost like 15 dB, of course, because you are now in this regime where you have single atom a lattice site and no fluctuations in the occupation in this incompressible regime of this band instrument. And you can do something more. You can, for example, directly calculate the entropy distribution of your gas by just looking at first principle uh, quantum mechanics. You just look at the probability of occurrence of you know, the 0, 1, and 2 occupations. And you can directly get an entropy map of the system. Okay, that also shows you something interesting, that entropy in these systems is never, in these trapped quantum gases, never homogeneously distributed throughout the system because we have this harmonic confinement, or well, in this case, this potato-shaped confinement, which generates this very strange kind of entropy, entropy distribution. But you see that in this band insulating core, you have very low entropy regions surrounded by higher entropy regions. And the nice thing I just want to show with these images, we can really spatially resolve completely this entropy we're just using first principle step make and just making use of the single snapshot configurations that we have. So this is of course much more than just saying something about the average density, which is a quantity that you could also get with other probes. But to calculate these other quantities, you really need to um, you really need to uh, be able to get the single snapshots. Yes. Why do I have now more entropy in the very central part? It's a good question because there we're already leaving the band insulator and starting to populate the next band already. So we're making a metallic state in the next band. And this metallic state is compressible and can carry more entropy again. So you see in this core, that's, that's what you're addressing here, you see slight increase in entropy again. Exactly. That's very nice. That you can actually see that. All right, and again, then, okay, you can just basically use your uh, standard thermodynamic textbooks as we 
showed in the last class, and I can fit basically, for example, using a grand canonical ensemble description, if this sample is in thermodynamic equilibrium, that's something I can actually check, because I can check, can I predict with just a few global parameters of my system, namely the chemical potential, the temperature, or the compressibility, can I basically predict the shape of what I see here, these distributions? Do they match what I would expect from ACPS in thermal equilibrium? Okay. And uh, then I can basically just fit those parameters to my system. All right. Uh, let's move on to another tool that we uh, really want to make use of also, is that we can not only observe, you know, what's going on at single lattice sites, but we can also um, control atoms of single lattice sites by basically shining a laser beam through the objective onto the atoms to basically be focused down to individual sites. So a laser beam would be focused down to a single atom in this lattice, and then we can do maybe a spin rotation, maybe remove that atom, to really control uh, the atom on that side. And uh, here's uh, how we do that in our experiment. So you have, let's say, this mod insulating state of ozones, for example, or fermions in one hyperfine state, in this blue hyperfine state. And then you go in with your uh, laser beam onto the atoms. And now what we do is that we don't use the laser beam to address directly to do an operation, but we just use the laser beam to introduce a uh, energy dependent shift, a stark shift onto the atoms, onto the energy levels of two spin states. So these are two spin states. This is the blue one, the one minus one spin state, the other hyperfine state, two minus two. And when the laser beam is shown onto the atom, the energy level of separation changes. Okay. And now I can basically just use microwave radiation to address this energy shifted atom. And that will only then flip this energy shifted atom to a spin rotation here or remove it. Uh, for example, we can uh, flip its spin now, and then we can uh, kind of move the laser beam to the next side and uh, flip the spin of another atom and then go on and on and on, like you know, really atom by atom by atom like a pencil, and write kind of any kind of spin pattern we want. And now to detect that, in this experiment we didn't have the spin resolution yet, so what we did, we just removed the blue component and we were then left with the address component, and that's the one we imaged. And here are just a few images to show you that this really works actually quite nicely. So we start with this unit filling background, and then we went with this pencil and wrote a square, for example, six by six atom square, uh, a line here, a uh, near antiferromagnet, a star, well, and this quantum physicist would like actually to be right beside also, of course, yeah, and, and, and we have 26 individual atoms placed on these lattice sites that you can see marked here as these uh, white spots. Now one technical comment for those of you who are working on experiments here, we always like to put an individual reference marker atom that's somehow lying away from the part of the physics. Why do we do that? Because in the experiment, because this is a, you know, this, you saw the setup, you saw the picture of the setup, and everything has to be kept, of course, interferometrically stable to have the lattice at the same position in space, and, and that's tricky because temperature drifts in the lab, so over the course of hours, night, day, when we do measurements. So this lattice actually, uh, fortunately only slowly, but very, very slowly drifts around okay, in space. Uh, but we would like to know where the lattice is actually is, where are the lattice sites centered on, and these individual reference atoms, they allow us to, 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 to identify you know, what the phase of the lattice is at a given point in time. And that, of course, is then helpful for the reconstruction algorithm, because this Adam tells us where the lattice is, and I can reference it, and then I can run the reconstruction algorithm on this process here, which is very high reliability. Now, one trick you also get, I didn't talk about that from this, um, from this, uh, from this addressing technique, that our spatial resolution in the addressing is actually much better than the laser focus. And the laser focus is basically uh, round again, this is a 700 nanometer beam would be, again, just a micrometer, maybe a wide beam, but the spatial resolution that we can get from this beam is actually much better, is actually in the uh, 50 nanometer region. And the reason how that works, why you do that, is the same trick that you use, for example, in magnetic resonance imaging. You create a spatially inhomogeneous resonance commission, right? So for a gradient, magnetic field gradient, for example, that makes a resonance condition between two states 
uh, shift in space. And then by frequency, you address a certain region in space. And then only your frequency resolution determines what spatial resolution you ultimately have. Okay. Is that clear to everybody how that works? So you basically now transfer the problem of spatial resolution to frequency resolution. And in our case, the Gaussian beam shape of the addressing beam basically creates an inhomogeneous AC star shift as well in space. And therefore, by selecting just a certain frequency, uh, we can have a much better spatial resolution than the waste of the laser beam here down to 50 nanometers. And that's really very nice, of course, for all this addressing. You can get this uh, 10 times better than the lattice spacing resolution. Well, we just shine global wave in that region. Again, you just make use oh, that these see. microwave photons mm -hmm. only interact with the shifted uh, atom. Okay, so it's like a okay, so whole, whole by the side. So let me, let me, so we have these um, two, two energy levels. Let's say F equal two and F equal one. And let's say the laser beam only shifts the energy of one of them. Okay, so in space. So let's say this is space. And let's look at the energy of this atom in space. So let's say for the F equal 2 atom, our laser does nothing. So this energy would be constant. And we can tune to that condition. Whereas for the F equal 1 atom, my energy would be strongly shifted where my laser beam falls. Now this width is 780 around 1 micron. Let's say 1 micron is the width of our laser beam. Okay? So from that, I do not get this high spatial resolution. But you see that the resonance frequency to drive this transition to the F equal 2 state now depends on space. Okay, so you made a spatially independent, spatially dependent resonance condition. And now, if you can shine a laser beam, for example, at this frequency, with high enough spectral resolution, then we'll have a much better spatial resolution than the width of your beam, because now you're only, the only thing that limits your spatial resolution is what is the spectral stability, what is the spectral resolution you have on that transition. So this is the central trick of MRI. Every MRI machine works like that. You apply, or you don't focus a laser beam onto your body, you apply, you apply this laser, and you apply magnetic field gradients. That's why you hear with the clacking, these loud noises in these machines. There are always some gradients that are applied in different directions. And they make use then of driving a certain transition frequency and thereby having spatial selectivity. And here we do the same thing. Okay? And so, so you see the laser beam for us just makes the energy shift and this now is microwave transition. And it's only resonant in space where, uh, where this is resonant. Okay, so all the other lattice sites, because they are, they are not addressed, they have this kind of resonance frequency that's not what we're shining in, so they're unaffected by that. So it's kind of this resonance imaging technique that we make use to achieve this high and spatial resolution. All right, so of course, you know, doing these things one by one is a bit tedious. So we want to take the next step in this and move on to generating more flexible potentials by using these so-called digital mirror devices. And these are like small micro mirror arrays, uh, like actually the one in this projector. It's just the same one, probably, where you can have small mirrors that you can tilt and tip and tilt, okay, tilt, turn, tilt on and off. And that allows you to project this image onto the screen here. And we actually want to do the same. And we want to just shine a laser beam onto those uh, EMD devices, which we then shape in an arbitrary way and project onto the atoms. Now, uh, that's, of course, very nice, because now you have total flexibility over your optical potential. It's not generated by interference anymore. You could generate crazy lattices. You could make like two reservoirs connected by a single wire. This something like to my testing that was very successfully in Zurich. You can also make box potentials if you don't like the harmonic trap and want a homogeneous system, you make boxes. Uh, or you make tunnel barriers or wires of light. You know, these atoms see as potentials. Okay, that's what you should learn. Now you see, things are not quite as simple, as good yet as we would like them to be, because if you look carefully at this box, it's not really super flat, okay? There's a little bit of ripple here. And that's kind of something we're fighting, we're trying to get around, is that basically whenever we shine coherent light on these devices, you always have spectral, laser spectral. And you've seen that probably uh, in, in different contexts. Whenever you have a coherent light source, it usually has a lot of power, but it has this undesirable effect of having laser spectral. And that's why you have this ripple here in, in, the, in the system. And one thing we're working on now is trying to build new laser sources, light sources, which are high power sources. So we have a lot of light to generate the optical potentials. But on 
the other hand, have them kind of spatially incoherent enough that the quality of the image we get is good or is as good as the one that you see, for example, projected by that beamer onto by that projector onto the screen. Because that, that doesn't use, of course, lasers, just use incoherent light sources, and you see the image you get is perfect down to the level of single pixels. Okay, that's what we want uh, essentially for, for the app for the app. If you can do that, then it would be of course fantastic because then you can control, we could control each individual bond strength. I could create a lattice potential where really I tell this bond should be this strength J1, this bond should be this strength J2, and I have total programmability in the in the lattices I make. Okay. And that's where we'd like to go, but that requires some technological development to get here. All right, let's, let's look at some physics that you could do now. And uh, let's look uh, at one experiment where we basically kind of shown a laser beam onto a single, a single atom and then removed the other atoms to create an impurity atom. We'll talk about the spin system just for now. I just want to uh, focus you, that you focus on the situation where we just prepared our single atom here on the defined lattice side, we remove all the blue atoms, and we just want to look at the motion of that single atom in the lattice. Um, one other thing we could do is shape the cloud in any other way we want. Uh, for example, I can sh you know, shine um, different kind of shapes of light onto the atoms to control the shape of the final cloud that I have, to have perfect size control, or basically make um, um, quite quadratic clouds, or cut out anything I want. I call this, this like a cookie method, where you go in with your shared desired state, the shape that you want to have. And you just stamp it out of your atoms and basically get the initial conditions you want. Okay, so just some examples of that. All right, so let's imagine we have cut out one atom and placed it on a single lattice side, and now we just want to focus on one new situation, and we want to understand what is the dynamics of that single atom. So if there's just one atom, there's no interactions. There's just tunneling, and there's just the harmonic trap. So it's actually very simple, and you can all solve that uh, in a few minutes in Mathematica. This is what I've plotted for you here. This is the probability distribution that you get after some time evolution. You start on some side, you evolve, and you get this very different distribution than in free space. You can just get a Gaussian ball, probably calculated in your quantum mechanics, of course, the spreading of the Gaussian wave packet. And here, of course, what you get is this quantum, what people call a continuous time quantum ward, or just a coherent evolution or a discrete lattice. Um, we want to understand a little bit better the motion of this. So what are the maximum velocities that you can get? So what determines here the front is maximum, the maximum speed at which this front moves? Well, remember in our lattice that has basically the maximum group velocity we could get, right? And the maximum group velocity occurred precisely for kind of these waves around um, pi over 2a. And that gave a maximum group velocity of 2JA over H bar. Just a moment, I'll come back to that. I just want to remind you again. We have the dispersion relation minus 2J cosine QA, right, for the simple lattice. And that gives us group velocity, maximum group velocity, 2JA divided by H bar. Okay. So that's the maximum speed you can move with. And that's basically in this lattice, and that determines the propagation speed of this wave front of this maximum here. Nothing can move faster than that. The question. Yes. So I have a question about the quantum law. Yes. So can we just, by looking at the wave function, can we just say that this is a quantum law for like, do we have other parameters also weights to verify that it's a quantum law? Um, um, what do you mean to verify? I mean, here, like, this is just a theory calculation. So each time, what I mean by continuous time, each time the particle is hopped from one side to the next, you can, you can decide do I want to now continue hopping one further side or go back. Then of course there will be interference with the wave function amplitude that sits there before, and this gives this interference, this gives this very weird pattern, this probability distribution that you calculate uh, for the just time evolution of the particle in the lab. I mean here really the only thing I did, I just took this Hamilton operator, actually in this case without the harmonic trap, and I just evolved the initial state, single side atom, and I just applied this, this part of the operator and did the time evolution. And I just calculated the probability distribution. That's what I did. So in a sense, that, that is a continuous time quantum okay. okay. So can we also like plot so if I'm, I'm correct? Okay. So, so this is different from discrete time quantum more. 
where people, let's say, move one step, then they throw a coin and decide again, do I want to move left or right? And so you always have one hopping event, then you have throw a coin, decide. Here we have continuous time evolution. That's why we call this a continuous time one. So it's more like a diffusion kind of? No, it's not diffusion. No, no, there's absolutely not diffusion. It has nothing to do with diffusion. It's total ballistic motion. There's co completely coherent evolution. There's no diffusion in here in this process. Right? It's ballistic motion, free particle evolution, just on the lattice. That's the only thing it is. So let's not make it more complicated. It's just just, just um, free evolution of a single atom on the lattice. Okay. And it gives this ballistic motion Three particle motion on that is with this maximum velocity that you can see here. Okay? Alright. Very good. Yeah. Please continue to ask. Yes, so and now let's, uh, let's um, do the, actually, yeah, we should mention that before. Why do we have this maximum group velocity? Well, remember our initial state, when you start with a single atom localized on a single lattice site and you can decompose it into block waves, it turns out actually that's the superposition of all the block waves in the complete band. So to make a lab atom, remember the eigenstates in the lattice were the extended block waves, to make a localized Vanier wave packet, which is where we started out, you actually have to make a superposition of all the block waves. So you have all of those waves in there. That's also another way, of course, to calculate the time evolution. You just expand your Vanier function into the superposition of block waves. You evolve each of the block waves with its eigenenergy, and that's it. That's your final state. That is another way, of course, to calculate that. All right. Good, so let's just look at this. Here's just a cartoon. Okay, we start with this one Morse race, as I say. We start with the atoms, each of one moves in their line, and of course it's all fake, because we don't know which of them won the race before we do a measurement. Okay, only the measurement determines which of those atoms actually won the race, and I always think these are like quantum horses because they run forwards and backwards simultaneously, right? So an interesting situation. So uh, here are some pictures of that. We prepare these atoms. The lanes are actually now in the x direction, so these one e wires, and each atom can only move in this x direction. And these are single snapshots, and this is how it looks. And then, of course, from single snapshots, you can't tell anything. You have to repeat the experiment many, many times, and then you get the probability distribution back. And that's why. Sorry? Uh, just because the lattice in y direction is very deep. So we make a, it's a 2D lattice, okay? But the lattice in the y direction is extremely deep. And remember, the hopping matrix element goes like exponentially with the lattice curve. So if I make this lattice in y very deep, I can basically make the tunnel coupling in the y direction zero. So it's like it's effectively the one that it's, it's like one, 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 one the class, Exactly. So like each one, start, each atom goes in this line. Okay. And uh, you also see something here. It's a little bit asymmetric, this distribution. Why could it be asymmetric, maybe? Shouldn't it be symmetric, what we talked about before? No, it's just a single shot, right? No, it's like nothing. No, this is not a single shot. This is average shot. This is a single shot. This is the average one. This, so this is what you get in a single shot. Just find the atom somewhere. Okay, from that you can determine actually nothing at all from this single shot. You really have to, of course, have many shots. That's the only thing one mechanics predict something about. But it's a little bit, you see, skewed. Why could it be skewed? It's the harmonic confinement. Yeah, the harmonic confinement. In this case, the trap was not exactly centered on that atom. So it was pushing it a little bit in one direction. And we can, of course, see that. Um, just, just for nice tea, I show we can even look at this for longer evolution times. Here's a nice quadrant quantum walk over almost like 30 lattice sites. And you see that the probability distribution almost perfectly reproduces uh, what, what, we, what, we, what we get expect from the so we really have beautiful coherent evolution of these uh, single particles in this lattice. Uh, but at this point, it's just all single particle, of course, evolution. Now, one thing I want to come to that Dima mentioned already was this light cone spreading uh, that we can now look at maybe in a, a more interesting scenario of interacting particles and look at the dynamics what we can expect there. So let me introduce this concept of light cones. So imagine we have. Um, a system with short range interactions, maybe a spin system, or, or atoms uh, on the lattice, Bohr's Hubbard or Fermi Hubbard, all of this matter really for now. In this case, we did it with the bosonic spin chain. And now oh, you ask, and you, know, you do something over here, you have some operator where you do some manipulation here, and you have the original side. How is that affected actually by this original, uh, uh, original operation? So essentially, what you want to know is how much do these operators 
A and B, after some time evolution, after you've evolved the state, yeah, or this operator basically, after this time evolution, how much do they commute? Yeah? How much that tells you, if they do not commute, that tells me that this side observable B on this other lattice side is affected by the operation A. If they commute, they're basically independently from each other, and you know, it just means that you know, if they would commute at that time, that would just mean that this side has not yet at all been affected by what's going on, what you did over there. Okay? So how fast does this actually, uh, how fast are these other side influences? And it turns out that uh, in this very beautiful work of Eamon Robertson, they bounded this uh, commentator and said that's actually given by exponential function of some velocity of this excitation propagating in the system times t minus the distance of your site to this, uh, to this original site. Now you can see we can have two situations. We can have L be larger than Bt, okay? So then this would be negative, and that means at that point we can have, we have exponentially small uh, commutators, okay? So we really basically have commuting observables at that point. So that just means if distance L is larger than Bt, some uh, characteristic uh, length here, propagation distance dt, then this is just exponentially small correlations and this basically commutes, basically meaning that you have no, you have not affected your, your um, observables inside from the operator b e, uh, with the operation between them on a. On the other hand, if you have um, bt basically, um, or l smaller than bt, then this can be positive and then you can have, let's say, large correlations between those, uh, those states and you can have large largely affected, you know, of course, largely affected by what you do on A. This isn't captured in this picture. We can think of it like this. We're doing some perturbation. This perturbation spreads out, uh, actually, uh, almost linearly in time, like a light cone fashion. That's why we speak of a light cone, how these correlations propagate uh, in time and space. And if you're outside this light cone, you're unaffected what you've done. If you're inside the light cone, of course, you are affected by what you've done uh, on, on this original side. And um, okay, so how can we how can we actually do that? Measure something like that. And the experiment we did was the following: to basically start with our mod insulator of the bosons that you see here, and then we actually rapidly change the lattice depth of this mod insulator. Okay. So we suddenly change from a regime where we have large u over j to a regime where we are still in the mod insulator but smaller u over j. Okay. So we suddenly change these parameters in this. Both Hubbard Hamiltonian. That of course means that this eigenstate of exactly one atom per lattice side is not a perfect eigenstate anymore of the system. Okay, so what's going to happen now? What will happen is the following: that you actually now start to emit quasi-particles due to this quench. And now we can try to understand the dynamics and record this dynamics in the experiment. It turns out what you do actually in this um, quench dynamics, when you rapidly lower the lattice depth, you generate particle hole pairs. Remember, particle hole pairs were the excitations that you could make on a side on the one insulator. You could take one atom here and move it to that side. That creates a double on, a doubly occupied side here, and a hole here. Okay? I just write these as blue and red uh, particles. This is a hole. This would be a doubly occupied side. That's the elementary excitation that you could make. I write them as blue and red because I really want you to think of them as spin ups and downs, also like an entangled the bell pair that you create actually in this case. And these are like entangled pairs of particles that you create that now propagate with maybe different velocities to the lattice side. Okay, so they will separate and you can then, what you would see in this dynamics, in this quench dynamics, you see we made this perturbation. We're asking now how fast is this perturbation racing outwards? And now what we would actually look for is we would try to find a hole here. How is that correlated to finding another a double on, or if we have parity projection, another hole over here? Okay. So when we find a hole here, how is that correlated with finding another hole at some distance e? Interestingly, we're not changing the average density in the process. So it's not like making a sound wave where you would just make a bump in density and see how that spreads out in time. That's what we're doing here. We're not exciting a density wave here. Slowly quenching the lattice, we're not exciting any, any sound wave in the system. Okay, so and then here's the data for this. So we're correlating now a hole here with a double on here, which we see is also a whole hole. And you can see actually as a function of time how this correlation maximum spreads out almost linearly in time. 
predict, very much predictive like what we expect from this type of dynamics. And this is our, the solid lines are EMRG simulations that we've heard about now in some of the talks. If we plot this in 2D, this maximum of the correlation spreading out, you can see that these whole, whole correlations indeed spread out very nicely, like in this linear fashion. So if you plot the, the line through that, it's very nicely what we expect from this type of dynamics. Okay, so and how fast are these correlations now spreading? If we look at the velocity, the relative velocity of these uh, hole and up one, we see that it kind of approaches 6 J A over H bar. So why is it 6 J A over H bar? Do you understand why 6? Did we say everything is like maximum 2 J A over? Wasn't the maximum velocity in particles, ballistic you know, particles are spreading in the lattice 2 J A? Why is it? Was it 6JA? Could make it 6JA over H bar. Any ideas? Well, first thing we have two holes, one moving left, one moving right. So each of them can move with a maximum velocity of 2JA. So that means basically it could be 4JA, it should be 4JA. But it's 6. Why is it 6? What makes it 6? Do you have an idea? Let's have a, let's make a quick plot again of the cartoon of what we're looking at. So you have this, this chain, right? And we're saying we, uh, we're looking, we want to look in this chain. How fast will the hole propagate? So how fast does this propagate? So there, yeah, that that's of course simply set by this atom tunneling over here, then the hole will have moved here, and that's of course just single particle tunneling. And single particle tunneling, remember the maximum velocity, that was just 2JA over H bar. Now we have the other situation where actually we're talking about a doublon that we created. Okay, remember we're talking about a doublon. Now we want to ask how fast does the doublon move? Well, for the double to move, clearly only the particle, one particle has to move. Okay, if this one hops over here, then it looks like the double has effectively moved. But it turns out that this maximum velocity is 4JA over H bar. Why is it 4JA over H bar? Why could it be 4JA over H bar? Why does that particle, why does the whole move with this kind of single particle velocity, but somehow the double moves twice faster? As we all said, you. No, it's nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with you. Yes? The the tunneling rate goes like um, the number of particles in the site. Yeah, yeah, on the right track. But I wanted to say also something on that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you have, remember you have the A dagger I, A J, of adjacent sites. And now, remember your bosonic operators, if you destroy one particle here on the double up, you can see you get a square root 2. If you create it on here, the single side, you get also a square root 2. So in total, they give you a factor of 2. And that's, of course, simply bosonic enhancement. That's what we know or know in the different phenomena that we see here as bosonic enhanced tunneling uh, in the system, where you just see that in this case, the double moves twice as fast. So it moves with 4 j a over h bar. The whole moves with 2 j a over h bar. So the relative velocity is 6 j a over h bar. OK, so we can understand. Actually, where that where that actually comes from, <laughs> quite nice. And the experiment get get uh, very close to that part of it. Okay, so this I'm not going to discuss. I'm going to leave it in the transparencies for you. And I want to move on now. How much time do I have still? Half an hour. Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. Okay, good. Okay. Because I really want to get closer to to the quantum magnetism part and everything that Thierry told you yesterday. Uh, and uh, do a little bit more this one than happens. Okay, so um, before we get started, uh, do you know what super exchange interactions are? If you don't know, we have to be talk about it, how they actually arise, because otherwise you wouldn't understand what I've got, how this actually works, this spin spin interaction. So who knows what super exchange interactions are? Or who doesn't know what? I, I know you've never asked that, I know, but uh, we should really, this is, we really need to get to know that, otherwise, you not be able to follow the next part. So I, you're shy, so let me, in my experience, let's just do it quickly and uh, try to understand. This was motivated actually by an important question in the 50s 
where people looked at these compounds like manganese oxide, and uh, they found actually the strong antichromatic ordering of the electrons in such compounds. Now, people were surprised by that because this uh, antichromatic ordering occurred in a regime where actually the electron clouds did not overlap. And that's weird because the exchange interactions you typically know, direct exchange, only works when electron clouds overlap. Right? Good example is a molecule or a helium atom. Okay, two electrons in the helium atom where the singlet and triplet states have different energy. On a molecule where the antiferromagnetic ordering or the ferromagnetic ordering is favored in binding and antibound orbitals. Okay? So these all have strengths of binding or strengths of interaction which depend directly on the wave function overlap. Okay? If the wave functions do not overlap, how come you can get still something like this with spin interaction? Okay, let's discuss it for our simple model. Uh, um, we do it for the case of bosons. Uh, for fermions, we'll see it's just a sign change. The argument is the same. You start with the Hubbard model. You have kinetic energy. You have interaction energy. And somehow we want to arrive at a spin model. That's some strict spin interaction. How does that work, actually? So let's imagine we have this double well. Let's simplify things as much as we can. We just go to a double well. We just start with a configuration up spin here and down spin here. Okay? And we're in the regime of strong interactions. Large room of gender. Okay? So we cannot simply hop atom over here and stay there. That will give a huge energy penalty of this on-site interaction and uh, energy. So, uh, but still, we can do that process in a virtual process. So we can go over here and then go back again to our original site. That's an energy conserving process. It involves two hopping processes, two hops, and an intermediate state where the intermediate state is just energy U. Okay? So we can do that, we can hop back, or actually now comes the interesting thing, we can have the blue atom hop back, that also leaves us with the final and the final state configuration, which is totally uh, in resonance with our initial state. It has the same energy as the initial state, but now the configuration of the two particles has been exchanged. So these are the two possibilities. So you can have actually in second order perturbation theory in kinetic energy, you can have uh, this process, which gives the identity, or you can have the exchange of the two particles. Those are the both two processes that you have. Now, uh, if you actually look at the coupling strength of this process, it's easy to say you have two hops, two times the kinetic energy operator, and you have this intermediate state energy, which was U. So the strength of this twofold two Second order coupling is just j squared over u. Okay? And since we have two similar initial configurations, we can have another factor of two that we put here. Uh, and it turns out, um, actually, and, and we have this one plus fixed chain operator. This process lowers the energy of the particles, so we put a minus sign in front of it. We have this one to keep up with us. And now we have to look at kind of what this operator, this exchange operator does. What are the eigenstates of this, this operator? Well, let's look at the ions shape, uh, this, the, the action of the exchange operator. What are the ion states of the exchange operator? Well, clearly they would be the uh, singlet and triplet states of all our spins that we can have in the lattice. Because exchange of the singlet states gives minus uh, the singlet state, exchange of the triplet state gives plus um, the triplet state. Okay, okay again, the of course, is the same. So, in essence, we can now write uh, the operator 1 plus exchange as just this coupling strength 2j squared over u times a projector into the triplet space. Okay. So the triplet space is now lower in energy. Our triplet uh, states for the bosons are lower in energy, and the singlet states are high in energy. And the energy difference between those high states is just given by my exchange coupling 2j squared over u and then we have the same order of operation. Uh, now, how do we get from this operator to the Spin interaction with the triplet projector? Well, that's easy if you have two spin half or one spin one half particles. Remember that the projector into the total spin triplet subspace, that's nothing than basically an SL times SR, the spin operators uh, on the left and on the right side, product of them, minus some uh, kind of constant. Okay. So we can now rewrite the effective Hamiltonian that we get as minus J change as left as right of the two spins plus some constant, and this constant we could just drop because it's just the overall energy loss. Okay, so this is how you get from these Hubbard models to spin models. Remember, in the regime of strong interactions and unit filling of your lattice site. You have one particle of the site, and you have to have strong interactions, 
And the sign actually here is only determined when they got bosons or fermions. The argument I gave here was for bosons, so they have ferromagnetic attractions, J exchange being positive. For fermions, remember when you exchange two fermions, you get another minus sign in the problem. Okay, it would be so the problem would be not one, one plus exchange, it would be one minus exchange operator because of this switch of the particles, and that actually leads to anti-ferromagnetic spin interactions in that case of fermions. Okay. So that's how we get from Hubbard models to um, spin models on neighboring lattice sites. And I think the basic thing is to remember again, this is really not, there's no kind of long-range interaction between two particles. It only comes because of on-site interactions, strong on-site repulsion, and exclusion principles. Okay. That's everything we, we, we do today. Let's change symmetry. All right, so uh, we can do an experiment and check just the dynamics of those. We can, for example, start with our singlet and triplet states, which for no magnetic field gradient would have uh, this energy structure, and we split by the exchange coupling. And if we apply magnetic field gradient, then our eigenstates change, as you can imagine. If you have a magnetic field gradient uh, and two different magnetic moments for your spin states, then, for example, these are the eigenstates in the case of very strong um, spin gradients. So you can start, for example, here, then jump, for example, here, and then look at the dynamics of the system that you get. And uh, so let's do that. Let's prepare the atoms in some spin up down configuration, then jump here. Here we know the eigenstates are single and triplet eigenstates, so we can just look at the dynamics of that state. And the dynamics of that state will then be just given by our spin spin operator, uh, which I can then, as Tiri actually, can you show that? I you showed it composed into these S plus, S minus operators, the spin flip operators, and an interaction term between the terms of the spin spin. Okay. So for our case now, only the S plus, S minus are relevant, and you see what they will actually do. They will take this up-down configuration and flip it into down-up, back into up-down, back into down-up, so basically just have coherent evolution between those uh, two spin configurations in the lattice. Um, yeah, let me do not go into details how we detect that, because that's the old fashioned. I just really want to show the data how, as you make interactions stronger and stronger, you really see this Heisenberg dynamics emerge. So here I'm plotting, uh, doing a double well, precisely the experiment I talked to you about. We're putting one atom per lattice site in this up down configuration. We're just looking at the evolution of the system over time for different Hubbard Hamiltonian parameters J over U. So we're just changing the J over U, we're making going from more weakly interacting to more strongly interacting, okay? And we're first plotting the population difference, and you see that as a function of time doesn't show anything. So you basically stay with, on average, one particle left, one particle right, no population dynamics changing. But if we look at the magnetization dynamics, if we look how magnetization dynamics changes, you can actually see now you see this very strong dynamics occurring in the system, okay? It looks a bit funky here. For strong interactions, it's basically just this single exchange sinusoidal oscillation flip-flop configuration that I promised you. Okay? There's a little bit of damping because of inhomogeneities in that experiment. The double worlds were not all the same, so it's a little bit damp, but you see actually <coughs> it's basically just a single kind of coherent now oscillation. Now what you see here, actually, you could ask what's going on here. Actually, here you have two frequencies in the problem. You have the exchange interaction, but since uh, the interactions are not super strong, you can still have first order tunneling processes as well. So you still have J processes as well as these exchange processes. So you have two beating basically of two frequencies in the system which give rise to this more complicated dynamics. As you make interactions stronger, you see that this fast dynamics of single particle tunneling gets more and more suppressed. You see how the amplitude gets very small of this fast oscillation on top of the slow one. Uh, so this is the residual single particle tunneling that you're suppressing more and more as you make interactions stronger and stronger. All right. Good. So let's move on to something that we did with TV actually. And uh, let's now look at something you would, should easily understand. The first experiment is now we go back to the spin chain and we flip a single spin. We want to understand the dynamics in this paramagnetic chain now of this single flip spin that we get in the lattice. And remember, now we're dealing with ferromagnetic Heisenberg interactions and we want to know what's going on. The way how we do it, you also know now, we shine this line of light, we flip the spins, we make separate lines, and then we look at, so that's what we do in time t equals zero, then we let the system evolve for a certain time, and then we take a photo. 
and we average, you know, to get the probability distributions. This is how we do things well. So how does the evolution look like? Well, we have the Heisenberg component, we decompose into the kinetic part, this S plus S minus part, and the interaction part. And for the single spin problem, you actually see, interestingly, the interaction term does not play any role, the S E S E term. Because you see, irrespective of where you put that single spin down, the energy of the state is always going to be the same. So that's just going to give us a total offset. So in this case, we can just scrap the interaction term. It doesn't play any role. We're just left with S plus S minus. And remember, the S plus S minus is just like the A dagger A, right? And single particle totally. So what you have seen for the single particle, you should just see for the single spin in the spin chain now as well. And that's indeed what we see. We flip a spin on side, the central side, and we see this coherent evolution, which is just the same probability distribution that you remember you saw for a single particle tunneling on the lattice. It's exactly the same probability distribution. Now things get a bit more tricky, and this is when the theory has to come into play, when you have whole excitations also in the system, intermixing with uh, basically the spins in the system, and you can see how they seem to need to decohere this nice quantum work that we have. So the spreading is still almost on the same size, but clearly the interference structure with more and more holes in the system gets degraded in the system. All right. Um, next thing I want to discuss is actually where interactions do play a role. And this is now a, an interesting solution uh, coming from Hans Beta's original paper where he introduced the beta ansatz on um, basically a bound magnum. So, what Hans Peter found that in the, when Felix Bloch analyzed the problem of magnons, when he saw that, that, that Hans Peter found that he, there was some problem with the counting of states. So something was not correct. So in, in Bloch's argument, there were just some states missing somehow. And that motivated him to do kind of an exact solution of the problem. So we're looking again now at the ferromagnetic spin chain. Um, with this S X S Y, and it could have some anisotropy, so like you know, you know, the X couplings, Y couplings could be different from the interaction parts possible. Okay. Now the states we want to talk about are these so weird, weird states, these so-called L-string bound states, or so-called bound magnons, which basically arise when you have a strong attractive interaction, for example, between two individual spins. So if there's a nonlinear interaction between the spins, which is so strong already at the level of individual spins, that they would stay bound together, okay, and propagate as a new quasi-particle, the bound magnon through the lattice. Okay. So so far the only thing we learned that if you flip a spin that propagates out, you would flip another spin that propagates out. But if there is an interaction between them, they can, and that's so strong that they can form a new quasi-particle, they will now form something that moves collectively to the through the lattice. And Beta actually found that there's not only this for two flip spins, but there's a whole array of solutions, the so-called bell strings of different length, where you have these really blocks of particles now, which of course now become heavier and heavier, because you now that this thing has to move with a new entire object, it's like much harder now for it to move through the lab. And these are precisely the solutions that beta beta found here. Um, let me go right to the to the heart of things, how we do this. So we, we flip two spins, you know. Yeah. yeah, for the string states, yes. uh, do the flip spins have to be close to each other? I mean, like, Let me explain for two spins. Uh, we will see actually that's uh, not exactly the eigenstate, the bound magnet state, and we'll see what the consequence of that is. Let me show you the dynamics actually in a second. So what we can do in the experiment, we can take this chain and really flip two spins here and look at the dynamical evolution. If these are the bound states, in a cartoon picture, what we expect, of course, that they just move as this um, bound state uh, together through the lattice. Right? Uh, if they are not bound, then they should just move independently through the lattice and uh, see nothing of each other, basically. Okay, so that would be the three bodies. So here I plot that again, I can, we can solve the problem very easily, analytically. And to my, show you what, what uh, the solution is, I'm plotting now the probability of binding the first spin on side x1 and the second spin on side x2. Okay? We're going to look at that as a function of time. Uh, and uh, so initially we start in this state where the two spins are right next to each other. Okay? And we first got to look at the case where we have no interactions between the spins. No SE term, just xy coupled. And uh, then what happens? Uh, spread out and actually 
what you see is like what the cartoon also showed. When you find uh, the first spin at a large uh, positive distance, then the second spin shows up at a large negative distance. Like that. They just separate from each other, basically. Okay? No, no interaction. No bound back. So now we go to the Heisenberg point. Delta equal 1. Uh, isotropic interactions. We do the same experiment. This is theory. I'll show you the experiment in a second. And now we see something interesting happens. Now you have a little bit of breakup of the particle, but mostly now stays on the diagonal. So it really moves together to the lattice as the bound state has been propagated. And now to come to your question again. So the reason why there is some actually um, separation is because this initial state is not does not have 100% overlap with the bound macron state. It's a little bit more complicated than just two particles in the chain. It has some superposition of them being on neighboring sides as well. And uh, since we're not creating the perfect eigenstate in this case, we're evolving, we have to decompose this initial state into all the states, and some of them are these non spreading states, but most of them actually are pretty well these, uh, these bound macron states. And this gets even better if the interactions become stronger. So if you make even stronger interactions, delta equal 1.6, you see that now the more stronger this is, this is an even better eigenstate. It becomes a better eigenstate the stronger the interaction is. So we more and more see exclusively the bound macro motion and almost no breakup anymore. Okay, this is All right, but we can do that with the experiment. So here's experiment and theory, and it's really showing that it agrees really quite nicely. So this is, we do this for the Heisenberg point. Unfortunately, we can't tune this in the experiment. So here's the um, um, experiment, exactly this probability distribution that I showed you. And here's what theory you get with it. And indeed, as you see nicely, we see the bound magma moving. And then you can even see this breakout of this other part of the wave function as well. So it's very, very nice agreement with the experiment and uh, between theory and experiment. And we can even compare the different propagation velocities. And you also already see what I told you in words before. These bound, bound objects, these magnons, in essence, you can think of them as the most elementary magnetic solitons that you have. They become heavier and heavier the larger they become and move slower than single magnons in the given lens. And in beta ansatz, there's an exact formula. You have exact prediction of the ratio of free magnon to bound magnon velocity, which is just two times this anisotropy term. Uh, for us, the delta is 1, remember? Uh, so we still find 2, and we find 2.3 with an error of 3. So as exponentials, we would say that agrees with it. Okay, um, do I still have a few minutes? Or we can move on a bit? Yeah. 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 All right, so I want to, because I want to ultimately move you slower than expected, but okay. better than faster. <laughs> so uh, let's, uh, let's, let's now go to the fermionic problem. This was warm up basically to get a little bit of feeling of how we measure what we can do, and now we want to go to the thermionic case. And uh, you'll hear much more. So, Mark has talked about this. So, two things you should remember for now. When we look at the Fermi Hubbard model in the regime of strong interactions and we have a 50 50 spin mixture, we can map this Fermi Hubbard model onto a Heisenberg model. That's what we derive. Okay? A double well, but it works also for a lattice. And now we have a plus sign here, so with J positive, this instead of thermodynamic interactions favors an Heisenberg antiferromagnetic ordering of the lattice. And now the whole interest in this, or one big interest, is of course to, uh, to connect this to real material science work, as Eugene told you. And the real material that's interested are, of course, these high TC superconductors, where you see here a kind of phase diagram of uh, experimental system, typical experimental systems function of temperature and doping. And you see actually for zero doping, these uh, copper oxide compounds, for example, all or show these nice antiferromagnetic ordering. So for zero doping, we're in this simple situation like here or close to that. And we can pretty much understand that antiferromagnetic ordering. That's well understood. What's not well understood is all this through here. So it's really when you introduce holes into the system that they do something weird, they give rise to this D-wave superconducting dome, all these crazy phases that you have here, and you want to understand that. So what you really, in essence, want to understand is how does hole movement compete with magnetic ordering, in our case, antiferromagnetic ordering in the problem. Okay, so that's, in the essence, what we want to learn about. So we want to take this antiferromagnet, you're getting dizzy, so I can't take it. <laughs> 
time. That's the that's up down up down really because remember we are, that would be the layer state when you only have as ESD interactions that would be the ground state. And if we're relating, but we have also this x y term. So in principle, this is a much more complicated entangled state. But I can't sketch that, so I just will always plot the the, the linear state for you. And the dizziness is supposed to be the entangled. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So we want to understand now uh, what happens if we put holes into this, even individual holes, even at the level of a single hole in this antiferromagnetic net. This is a difficult problem, as we'll see. And uh, we want to do this in two D, and we want to do this uh, connect to Thierry's lecture, and we want to uh, learn from his book, uh, and from his lectures. You know what do these holes uh, and doubles do in the system? How, as Thierry showed you, the physics should be dramatically different in the two cases. We have fractionalization, spin charge separation, topological excitations in one D, whereas in two D these things become bound and cannot separate. So there should be dramatically uh, different physics that we see in those in those. All right, uh, just to, to finish off maybe then for today, and then we'll just finish that also tomorrow, then in the lecture, the first part of the lecture tomorrow. There's been like a dramatic progress in the experiments, as I mentioned on that. Uh, here's a beautiful experiment from Markus Reiner's group where they show that you can create these 2D antiferromagnets. So basically create a 2D system, 50-50 uh, mixture of spin ups and downs. Uh, you cool it as much as you can, and you really enter this antiferromagnetic phase, and you can really see this antiferromagnetic ordering of your particles on the lattice. So this really works. You make one insulator, you move further, now the spins order, so they go into an antiferromagnetic phase, and these are the states we want to now understand, want to play with, uh, want to discuss uh, how that uh, actually works. Um, maybe just, just give me this uh, few minutes for. Okay, so just, just the, how we do the spin charge, should we talk about so much about detection, it's really easy for you to understand now, how we do the spin detection, spin resolve detection as a lab. So this is for our pic for picture for our experiment, uh, where we have now one insulator of spin up and down fermions in this 2D lattice. Sometimes we make the lattice like this, this is what we call a short, short space lattice. Sometimes we introduce a factor of two, the separation in the vertical direction, but the particles can still move in that direction. So if you see a picture like that, you shouldn't think of it as just a 1D system, but the particles can hop from here to here, it's just that the lattice separation is bigger. <coughs> I'll tell you in a second why we actually do that. But uh, this is as much a 2D system as this is a 2D system. It's just that its physical embedding in real space is different, but the tight binding model this maps onto is exactly the same than this one. Okay? Alright. So how do we get spin charge uh, resolution. So here's the trick that we employ. Uh, so and that's now you understand why we need this larger spacing in one direction. So imagine you have a 1D chain and you have this, say, this spin up and down configuration on this 1D chain and you want to get a spin resolution. Now what we want to, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a single well, say single lattice site, and actually with another laser, another optical lattice of half a period, going to split that single well we're going to take a single well with an atom in the ground state of that single well, and we're going to transform that into a double well each side. Okay? If we do that adiabatically, this Gaussian ground state wave function goes to the Gaussian goes to the ground state of the double well. And we know what the ground state of the double well was, well that was just a symmetric superposition of those things. But we want to do this now under the action if we now apply during the splitting process. We also apply a magnetic field gradient, and this is maybe a spin down atom. Then this spin down atom will not end up in a localized position, but will be pulled to the uh, side, which is lower in energy. Because remember, you have an energy gradient here, so if I do that in my energy for the spin down atom, the, ladder, the double well looks like this. But for the spin up atom, the lattice looks like this. Okay. So a spin down atom will be pulled to the left, to this side, and the spin up atom will be pulled to that side. Almost 100% Okay, yes. And with this separation, you choose basically um, a projection which, uh, along which like a super pro uh, projector uh, spin by. You make, in this case, you make a SD measurement, but I can change that because before the detection, I could just apply rotation powers globally if I want to measure as X. I just rotate, before detection, I just rotate with the global pi over 2 pulse between the two spin states, I rotate them in any direction I want. Okay. 
it doesn't have my spin chain as long as I put a physics of freedom in uh, Oh, sure. Or oh, this is just during detection. Okay, this is yeah. then what you just do during detection. Then you just apply this rotation just before detection. Again, the detection works. You freeze out the system, so you make the lens where nothing moves anymore. Exchange is quenched, dynamics is quenched. You just freeze in the state that you would have generated, and then you do the detection that I showed you. And then if you want to detect, you detect instead of a Z as X, then you just do a rotation just before you do the fluorescent scattering. You could even do S X on one side and S C on another side. How would that work? Well, in that case, you would have to rotate the spin, the pi by 2 pulse on the spin on that side, and no pi by 2 pulse over here, and then measure both in the S C basis. Right, so we make the first rotation here, no rotation here, that would measure S X here and S C here. That's more complicated. That we don't like to do so much, but in principle, with the addressing, the capabilities are there to do that. Did I answer you? And my confusion is basically if I do the physics, at basically my physics is at no E field um, unfermented magnetic spin shape. Yes. No gradients, yes. No uh, so There is a peak field because there's a patch bump. Yeah, but I think the, the Hamiltonian I explore is like it has no E field. Right, and the, big, and the number and the ups and down spins are conserved simply because we're using two spin states which are largely separated in energy. But then I would guess that you don't know where S, X, S, Y, and S set is, right? There's a, there's a freedom, degree of freedom in. Well, of course, our global magnetic field sets of quantization ah. axis, the overall field sets of quantization axis, you look off. Yeah. You can choose, it's convenient to choose. But the, the interactions are completely isotropic. The interactions we choose then are completely isotropic isomer interactions like what we said. So the interactions are not anisotropic. Just that sets you on basically when you measure that, that sets what you, if you measure as C or as X. You know, you but again, you just choose, you can choose for the spins and you can the rotation by rotating the spins in the right axis to measure as the best X or Okay, now we do that for the whole chain. Okay, so we just take one of these chains, and now we do this trick of splitting. Now you remember each side is split into two with the spin downs moving down and the spin up moving up. And now you actually will end up with two chains where the spin ups are moved down, the spin uh, sorry, spin downs are moved down, the spin ups are moved up. This is shown here. This was one original lattice side, uh, lattice uh, line, one uh, one of these lines. It was split into two, and now you can read off the spin configuration. No atom here, no atom here. A spin down, a spin up, a spin down, a spin up, a spin down, a spin down, a spin up, a spin up, and a spin down. Okay, so out of that, I can put together this was the configuration I measured. And that's like for the theorists among you, that's like having a quantum Monte Carlo snapshot of your calculation. But of course, this is not uh, no calculation. This is a real thing. So let me just show you the two final images of this. This would be the 2D system without seeing uh, the spin. Charge is resolved. We see 0, 1, and 2, but spin is not resolved. And now we do the spin resolved detection, and now you see everything. Now you see where the spin ups are, where the spin downs are, where the holes are, where the double ones are. And now you can take, again, hundreds of those images with full spin and charge resolution. Okay, that's what we're going to make use of now in the next lecture. Because we know where the holes are, we know what the spins are doing, and now we can understand the problem, how do the holes interact with the spins. That's precisely the experimental capabilities we need to keep those kind of experiments. So in this particular shot, where is the double on, for instance? A double on is this side, because there's a spin up and a spin down on that side. Uh -huh. so remember, that was original, that was one lattice side. This is just detected, and it's split into two, so here was a double on. Yeah, there is further enough. Okay. Yeah. So that's really the power that we have at hand. And that, that's nice because, I mean, it's a bit tricky. It's, of course, much more involved to detect the atoms like that. But if we want to correlate poles with spins, you need to see what, what they're doing. You need to see everything. All right. Good. So I think we'll stop here then and uh, take it from there and promise to catch up with Jerry this weekend and show you how we can see fractionalization in real space and all these things that Jerry introduced and see them actually in the experiment. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.
first place we should draw that side thankfully. Yes. So what, what prevents us from like making our lives sufficiently deeper such that atoms you know, can't escape? Like is it the laser problem? We just bought the most powerful laser we could buy and uh, yeah, it's just basically you know, we also we we have three fifty one lasers, each one for each axis, that's a lot of laser power. And uh, as you know, and uh, that is tricky to handle also. I mean of course you could buy when you get hundred watt or two hundred watt lasers which for single frequencies you don't have, that's a bit more tricky. But but also handling these high powers is in the lab is just not nice. Because you get double lensing effects every time you hits the lens, just for the purest among you, every time these high power beams hit an optical element, there's a little bit of absorption of that laser in that optical element. The lens, for example, or some piece of glass, heats up, changes its refractive index, changes its focal length, so everything becomes like honey non linear and like super <laughs> non nice, okay, from an experimental point of view to that. So we really go to 50 watts and try to get that from fibers, which is another tricky. So, but it's basically limited, I would say, yes, by, by laser also, power. It doesn't help intensity. You have like light atoms, sorry, lithium atoms. That doesn't help either because their recoil is very large, so this recoil energy scale is of course huge. So that makes it also more complicated. And, and my second question is like, as you know, like in theory's lecture yesterday, when we like create a charge like a station and it's spinning station, they form a bond state. Yes. And in how 2D. In 2D, yeah. How do you see in the like probability distribution? This wait for my talk tomorrow or Fabian, I don't know Fabian today when you talk about it. So probably tomorrow. Tomorrow also. So you have to wait until tomorrow. <laughs> we'll, we'll, precisely what we'll talk about. It will show you show you exactly this dramatic difference between 1D and 2D. Everything that today is showing you will show you in the experiment. Well, not everything, but <laughs> large parts. Yes? How do you switch between the stuff and the ISS again? Uh, is it the the, You mean uh, in the detection process? or? Yeah, I guess just in general you can go from the previous lattice to the new lattice. So well, that just has, that's just a quick turn on, basically. Well, here, this uh, this is a bit different. This is not a detection lattice yet. It's yeah, a second yeah. detection lattice. This, this, so you see you have to have two lattices. You have to have a lattice which makes um, this configuration, this one, right? So, so which makes these lines. This is what you see now. So you have a lattice with a factor of two longer wavelengths in this direction and in this one. Then you have to turn on a well lattice which has exactly half the period, which does the splitting. So this is the thing that you know you have a long wavelength thing, and now you turn something on that has precisely half the wavelength on top of that. And this will now split this well into a double well. So you get basically an array of double wells. Okay. So this is what this does. You have to, of course, turn it on with the right phase. Otherwise, if this thing are not aligned, uh, then they will give tilted double walls, which you could sometimes also make use of. It's good to So we have that phase control. So we can turn on these lattices relative to each other with different strengths, with different phases. So you turn that up slowly. So you adiabatically do this splitting under the presence of a gradient, which gives you the pulls the atoms up and down. And then you turn on the pinning lattice. So then comes this pinning lattice. Uh, which is the actual detection lattice, the short space, the very short space lattice, which super samples everything, and, uh, and in which we do the progressive detection. So that seems complicated, but it's worth it. Why are you, it's worth it. But why are you actually turning on? Like, I assume you start with like, a laser, and then there's some sort of... Uh, we start with this, we start with this long wavelength. Like, oh, the, how we do it in practice? Well, there are different ways, but typically how we make these standing waves is you just take one laser beam, you focus it on through a lens to some certain way, okay? And you send it to another lens, and then you put maybe a mirror here, so that laser beam is reflected, propagates back, and forms the standing wave here. Okay? And then you do that in three directions. And then you do it with the super lattices, two more, and then with the pinning lattice, three more beams. So you see, it gets, uh, gets <laughs> we need good credit students to handle that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and all face control, well, together, so it's tricky, yeah. But it, it works. And you do this one here, and the other one in the other direction. And then everything you do is just intensity control. You just have power control over your lasers, and face control of these lattices relative to each other. So you can really turn on the double well in the symmetric configuration. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
I have a question. From my understanding, when you talked about the single site addressing, um, a bit of the precision came from the fact that you had a, a, a gradient and a shift, a, a spatial gradient. In our case, we have a gradient, but this inhomogeneous profile, right? The, the laser profile. And we had in the MRR, they would just use a gradient. So by choosing the frequency, you get you address a specific point in space. So this is space. This is a gradient. You have two states, so you have a varying resonance condition. So this is you can and, and the resolution you get is of course now the frequency resolution determines what spatial resolution you get. Okay. Yes. And then my, my in question. our case we don't have this. In our case, yes, to complete the picture. In our case, we have the Gaussian laser beam, which creates also the homogeneous resonance condition. So we do try to address here this point. And now we spread the delta x I get is again just determined by my frequency resolution. And then my, my question is, um, and then you afterwards talked about how you um, use DMD mirrors to actually address several regions of the uh, that site. There, can you take advantage of this yeah. approach? Yeah, no. because you may have your 2D system. Let's say you have your 2D uh, block insulator. Okay, so it's now filled with atoms. One atom per side. Okay, so forth. And now we shine a laser beam, a line of light. Now a line of light, not just a focus of one beam, so it's make, we make it be very elliptical. A line of light, I showed you with the DMT, we make a line of light. We shine the line of light onto those atoms. So now the resonance frequency of all those atoms will be shifted. And now I just shine in global microwave you know, radiation onto the system. So all of these atoms on that line will be flipped, can be spin flipped. You still have this. Yeah, but this is uh, this is now creates is now in this direction. In, the, in that direction, it's all the same. Right, but if you have several lines that you address, you still have that profile. Uh, if I want several lines, well, then I just change my laser beam to uh, this stripe pattern. Okay, then each of those lines will be shifted by the same amount. And then I, so any pattern you want, you just basically have to create the same intensity. You have to bring the same intensity on the atoms that you want to address. Because the intensity is what determines the resonance frequency. So we do that also. We make stripe patterns, different period, cookies, stars, you know, whatever, whatever you want, basically. Okay. Okay.